We're pulling to the end here. Last panel of the day. Thank you all for sticking with us. Um, I am so excited to introduce you to all of these people down here on the panel. I wish I had an hour with each one of them, um, but we don't, so we're going to move really fast. Before we dive into this panel, I'm going to kick us off with what is a controversial statement for a room full of people who are interested in public interest technology. Everybody ready? Corporations are people. <laughs> Go ahead, just notice your reactions. Corporations <coughs> are people. And I'm going to ask you to fil think how you are filtering those reactions right now. And if how you filter them today is any different than how you might have filtered them last week or maybe even at the beginning of this day. Um, I've told you this morning that my role here at San Jose State is uh, to lead corporate and foundation relations. And for those of you who were with us for opening remarks, you heard me say that um, we are a proud engine of economic mobility, that we are Silicon Valley's minority serving public institution, that we are 82% people of color and 44% first in family to college, which provides me with a really unique view of Silicon Valley. There is a lot of white noise in this valley. Not only do we have some of the most elite institutions as neighbors, we also have institutions from around the country with satellite offices here because they recognize there is wealth and opportunity and innovation. Um, all day, five days a week, seven days a week, sometimes 10 days a week, I'm sure some of you have had 10 day weeks. Um, I think about how we work with private sector partners to create pathways of opportunity and to close equity gaps. Uh, today we've been talking quite a bit about building bridges and getting to know people on a personal level. In my role, when I hear the names of technology companies behind the logos, I think of the human beings. Uh, when I hear Salesforce, I, I think Ron. When I hear Adobe, I, I think Stacy and Courtney and their colleagues, uh, Mo and Ellen and Amy. I could go down the list of all of the companies and I could talk to you about the incredible human beings who are dedicated to what they are doing, who are our partners, who believe in closing those equity gaps and supporting public education. So today I've, I've asked four friends and partners and colleagues and allies to education to join us to give a little insight and add a little context into who we are in Silicon Valley behind the logos. So I'm gonna ask these people to do, last panel of the day, we're gonna move quick, we're gonna do it speedy. I'm gonna rapid fire down the line here. I'm gonna ask them each to introduce themselves. They're gonna tell you their name, their role, their organization, and a little bit about their professional path and why that uniquely positions them to be a part of this conversation. I encourage you all to read their bios on your own time. They've all had tremendous careers and are bringing really unique perspectives. So I'm gonna go ahead and start us down all the way at the end with my friend, Ron. Ron, can you introduce yourself? Can you hear me? Oh. Ron Smith, I'm the VP of uh, Philanthropy at Salesforce with Salesforce Foundation. I've uh, been there for set, almost eight years now. This is my second career. For my first 20 years, I was in K-12 education. Very proud. Still am an educator. I was a teacher. I was a uh, elementary and middle school principal. I supervised middle schools. and I finished doing tr school transformation and turnaround. My pathway and journey was guided. I'm a third generation educator. My grandmother was a high school teacher. My mom was elementary teacher. Then of course my path and my oldest son is a middle school counselor and now he's an assistant principal. So it's in our blood. Um, and what drove me here besides amazing people was really the aspect of uh, trying to understand how technology, how AI, how the world we live in is transformed and what are the impacts and what does it mean for the young people, specifically those furthest from success, specifically African-American, Latinx, specifically even more than that, young men, as we think about the future and the world we live in. As mentioned before, the world has changed a lot recently and we need to understand how we can support them going forward. Thank you, Ron. Stacy. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for sticking with us. Uh, Stacy Martinet, so I lead um, a few aspects of the marketing and communications at Adobe. Uh, communications, social media, our events, and our corporate social responsibility. Um, I came to Adobe uh, eight years ago uh, from New York City. Uh, I was working in the media and entertainment industry. I started my career at the New York Times. Um, I wanted to be a journalist. 
because I wasn't good at math and I wasn't good at science. Uh, my dad was an auto mechanic. My mother was a secretary at what is now known as a company called Verizon. Uh, but at the time growing up, it was a regional phone company. And um, you know, they said, go get a college education and figure it out. And I liked people. I liked learning their stories and I liked telling their stories. And so I wanted to be a journalist. I quickly learned, working at some newspapers, that I didn't want to be edited. Um, so I decided to go in communications, <laughs> which is actually the opposite, where you're edited all the time. And so I joined the communications department of the New York Times. Um, and I came up there and started working early on. If you can remember, when social media first became a thing on helping journalists get involved and thinking about how stories would transcend to a new medium. Uh, I was there for a little bit, then went to a startup publication, and then um, ended up at Adobe. And I was passionate about the tools that Adobe makes to empower anyone to tell their story. Uh, we have a very deep partnership uh, with San Jose State University, so it's an absolute privilege to be on campus. Um, and we're excited about the work the university is doing to lead in AI and bringing more diverse voices into it. Thank you, Stacy. Tony. Thanks, Stacy. Hi, everybody. I'm Tony Mestris. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Sobrato Organization. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Sobrato Organization as, the, as their conversation continues. But this is really represents the third chapter uh, in my career. The first was pretty much for profit. I spent uh, the better part of 22 years in high tech, most of that at Microsoft. Uh, my last role there was I was on the senior leadership team for uh, our leader who ran Windows, Xbox, and Surface. And then I had a managed midlife crisis, decided I wanted to do something of value to the world around me, and was able to make a leap to uh, lead a large community foundation up in the Northwest, Seattle Foundation. That was chapter two. Um, after eight years leading that organization, focusing on uh, creating a vibrant community for all in the greater Seattle region, I had an opportunity to uh, help one of my former colleagues start up a health data company, Truveta which uh, relies on AI, and uh, then worked uh, with Arabella Advisors to try to channel scaled uh, funding to uh, you know, protecting the planet, uh, protecting democracy, uh, driving equity, strengthening communities, and uh, just about a year ago was lucky enough to take this role leading the Sprato organization. That third chapter really represents a unique opportunity to lead an organization that is both mission and profit and attempting to uh, live our mission of building a more equitable and sustainable world through business and philanthropic leadership in an integrated way. So it's a very unique model and we can talk more about that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peter Larome Munoz. I serve as general counsel and SVP of tech and innovation policy for the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. You know, my background, uh, I think, Tony, sort of similar to yours, is that we've taken kind of a winding road to get to where we are. And I started off my career as an intellectual property litigator uh, with a, a small firm here in the Valley. Then decided after doing that for a couple of years, that was not the career path that I wanted for the, for the remainder of my, uh, my professional journey. I actually served then uh, afterwards as a deputy district attorney in San Benito County, where I have family and where my father grew up. Um, and so I served as a, a prosecutor there for about six years, then made the switch uh, back to the, uh, to the private sector, worked as in-house counsel for a small financial advisory firm up in the city, and now then with the, uh, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, where we focus on policy, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on, because that is very much a big component of how we as a society are going to address both the opportunities and the challenges of artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. So for me, my journey is one of, uh, of being a lawyer. Uh, so what we do all day as attorneys is you apply facts to the law. And right now that AI law, people always ask me, what is the law around using this material? What is the law around training you know, data sets and things like that? We're still trying to figure that out. So for me, it's fun. As a, as a lawyer to try to, to be at the, the kind of the cutting edge of where the law really is being made, but also from the policy side, engaging with the people, the politics, and the policy of all of this around the technology. So those two lenses, I think, really kind of inform my perspective here today. 
All right, well, we're going to come to you again. We're going to start this way in a moment. But now that we know who these people are, we're going to get a little bit more inside their brain. All day long, we've been talking about the nuances of AI, right? The good, the bad, neither good nor bad, nor agnostic. I'm going to remove all the nuance. I'm going to paint with big, broad brush strokes. And I'm going to ask you all to answer this question rapid fire, OK? AI has the possibility of being a great democratizer, closing equity gaps. And it has the possibility of widening equity gaps in ways that are perhaps unrecoverable for humanity. I would love for you to tell me one thing that you're excited about AI and the opportunity, and one thing that concerns you. Go for it. That's a, there's a lot to pick from there. I think one thing for me that excites me about the technology and the promise therein is really the potential to deal with, with big data and large data sets, to parse through information in a way that is faster, more accurate, and more consistent than can be done at a human level. And figuring out what those insights are from big data, uh, I think is something that has application in any number of fields, whether that is uh, around climate change, whether that's around healthcare, the financial industry, I, I think that's something that, that is truly exciting to me. I think one of the challenges uh, around, uh, around artificial intelligence really is ensuring that we take measures to kind of mitigate some of the potential negative externalities. And so you talked about bias, you talked also uh, as well about widening income gaps and things like that. And I, I think that that is one possible future if we are not responsible in how we develop the technology. But I, I will say, even at a higher level for me, um, is, is I look at what an over-reliance on the technology might lead people to think about truly human uh, endeavors, especially around creativity. And let me, let me just take a quick, quick uh, side note here. Um, so I know a lot of creatives in my life, uh, you know, artists and, and writers and authors, and many of them talk about the tyranny of the blank page and sitting there and struggling with coming up with an idea. And it is so incredibly tempting for a lot of them to just simply go into one of the big online platforms and just simply say, hey, what should I write about for my blog this week? What should, give me a prompt for the poem this week that I want to put out on X, Y, and Z. And I think there is so much value in sticking with that challenge and growing that, that intellectual endurance to stick with a problem. Um, and so I, I think for me, one of the big challenges that I see is an over-reliance and a short-circuiting of that creative process. Thank you. Yeah, Tony. Um, building a little bit on what Peter said, and given he set the stage on what rapid fire means, I'm going I'm to yeah. get just a li <laughs> little bit more of that clan. The, if you zoom out, the world is full of about 300 major metropolitan regions. In the US, call it about 30. Usually a hub, urban center, string of secondary cities. Sometimes they're multi-county, like the Bay Area. Sometimes they're one big county. <coughs> All of those regions are where population is surging and it's where there's access to education, access to economic opportunity, the list goes on. It's also where some of the greatest inequities, uh, and especially racial inequities, exist. And when you look at those regions, our region is by far uh, the most innovative. It is also statistically the wealthiest. And one could argue that it has all of the assets that any region could possibly ask for in trying to address those Harvard scissor charts of inequities. The question becomes, how do we arrange our assets against our disparities? And what I'm most excited about is how we can actually work together and especially work with community to take this incredible technology and try to both understand the problem statements much more clearly and, and collectively, as well as organize what our North Star indicators are that we're trying to aim the channeling and fighting fragmentation of those assets against from education achievement to economic opportunity, to addressing climate change. And then in addition to that, you know, really develop the solutions, the how of it. Um, so the channeling of ideas, talent, and capital using AI 
to address this perpetual problem that I would argue is, is the greatest threat to the welfare of all of our residents in our, in our country in this region that is most equipped to do it is beyond exciting. I think uh, from a concerning perspective, everything we know about how technology has influenced disparities and inequities is multiples more true with regard to AI. And if we don't provide the necessary access to communities, uh, to kids who come from marginalized communities, then the gaps will widen at a pace that we've not seen before. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Um, so the good, I think in the future, all jobs will have an aspect that's digital. And there is a democratization that having conversational interfaces, chat, can do. Um, and where you used to have a high bar for knowing deep technology and knowing deep data sets, there will be more jobs available in these fields that people can onboard to or upskill quicker. For storytelling, which I talked about earlier, you know, the blank page is amazing for creatives and it really pushes the process. But we all have to communicate increasingly visually and digital in our jobs, in our personal lives, in our protests, and for self-expression, AI can be a great assistant to get started on that journey. And so it's opening up more possibilities in creativity and content creation. And I think that's good, and I think there are economic upsides to that, as well as a culture that's reflective of more people's voices, not just the people who can make the media. What I worry about is the truth and misinformation. Think about the photograph. The photograph meant something happened. It was real, it was history, it was a memory. It was on a newspaper, it was on a website. And increasingly, it's hard now to tell what's AI generated versus what is an authentic image, photograph, video. Um, and we are going to have to educate an entire new generation about what digital literacy is. Where in the past, I think many of us grew up, which is trust and then verify, we'll now have to verify and then trust. And that is a seismic change in how we learn, how we communicate, and how we move forward as a society. Ron. Um, when I talk about excitement, I think Tony touched on it. The access opportunity is incredible. Young people have been using AI and technology tools for the longest. They're far more advanced than any adult in this room. In fact, we need to catch up to them. So I think that's the first phase. So the opportunity to ensure that everyone has access anywhere, assuming that they have the technological tools such as internet access and they have the tools themselves, but everyone seems to have a phone. So it's really exciting to see this opportunity that people of all ages can connect, that they can have conversations, they can have discourse, hopefully that's powerful and strong and not negative, but they have that opportunity to engage and they can be on different sides of the planet. That access is critical to growth, to education, to enlightenment. So that's super exciting that these tools can be personalized. They can help build you as an individual. They can help guide you and, and really give you a lens and give you information, while also giving you a voice, if it's done correctly and also used in the right way. What I am very concerned about, and it is a bit about equity specifically, is that specifically those groups that are in greatest need, that are furthest from success, miss the opportunity. The opportunity is now, it's not in the future, it's not in a couple years. We recognize there's already so many groups that are further behind than others, that are from, the, from an academic standpoint in math and reading, they're years behind from access to housing and healthcare and many other things and food and securities, they're behind. What will happen, as Tony mentioned, if they miss out on this next generation, the next wave of the future? All of those, those gaps will be so wide and so vast for all of those populations, regardless of color and creed, but those that are already behind, but even more so those that are already behind now, that you're talking about generations that will be so far behind that they will never catch up. They will never have the opportunity to have the access to what the future holds. And that is a fear that everyone should hold. 
And when you think about a young child who come out of COVID, many young kids, they were in COVID and they're in third and fourth grade. They didn't go to school for two years. So now this third and fourth grade is trying to play catch up as it relates to their academic endeavors. Now they're also playing catch up in the technological world. That ninth grader that didn't go to school in sixth and seventh grade, that senior that potentially because of how high school works now hasn't been in school since they were in middle school and junior high. So what happens if in this technological world they are now behind again? And that's the thing that we should all think about and fear in the fact that if we cannot ensure that they hit the moment today and are prepared to connect at all ages across all all colors, creeds, and across all people, that their future will be dim. And this is not a doom and gloom, this is just the absolute truth, that they will be so far behind that society will look back on this moment and say, we should have thought about it then, instead of just doing it now. Thank you all. I, I wanna appreciate you for redefining rapid fire because I think what all of you said was really important and needed to be said in this room with my colleagues to know a little bit more about the human beings that are behind the logos. So Stacy, I'm gonna come back to you, speaking of logos. You mentioned the power of the picture, right? Sort of is this arbitrator of truth over time. And that might not be true any longer. Um, Adobe early faced some criticism about AI generated images. Can you talk to us a little bit about how Adobe is thinking now, the, the lessons learned from those early times? Yeah, so I think it's twofold. First, there's something called Photoshop. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, and remember, we've all been on a journey for Photoshop. What's edited? Is it the right thing to do? Is it ethical? So it's someone's body change, right? Um, and so certainly, people have to take in advance and edit their art. And there are pros and cons to that. Any technology is going to have an upside and an unforeseen societal downside. I think that's been the theme here. Um, so as we looked at AI, in particular generative AI, we had to think deep about how Adobe, which is a company for creators, for creativity, serving customers who make their livelihood off of their intellectual property. How are we going to deliver the most cutting edge technology to serve our customers, because that's what we do and that's what they expect, but do it in a way that would be creator first, do it in a way that would be responsible. Um, and so we made a decision that the model we would train, because it all comes down to what model you are pulling into your applications, that model would only train on content that we had the license to train on or content that was in the public domain and not copyrighted, as well as bodies of content that we purchased where we have the license. So therefore the output that's generated would be commercially safe, meaning you are not infringing on someone else's intellectual property. Um, so that's been the approach we've taken to our creative models, whether that's imaging, design, vectors, and video, uh, which is currently in a beta. That's the first part of it. And we had to listen to feedback from our customers about that. And when we rolled this model out, we did face some criticism on the quality of the output and was it going to be advanced as others who were trading on a bigger data set. Um, and ultimately we stood by the decision and still stand by the decision, but we brought our customers in to contribute and push the model and make it better and make it better and make it better and that will be an ongoing process. I think the second part of that is the work we're doing on what's called content credentials which is to embed basically metadata into images, videos, et cetera, so that there is a record, if you will, of when something was created, when it was edited. And ultimately it's up for consumers to then decide and verify, is this something that they trust? Um, and we started an industry consortium in 2019. There's now 3,000 participants across publishers, technology companies, camera manufacturers at the point of capture. Um, so this is just the beginning of the work that needs to be done on an even grander stage around that. And so I think that's also an important component about AI is that you will be able to also verify if something was created using AI or not. Thank you, thank you. Ron, I'm gonna come back to you. So, so Salesforce has also faced some scrutiny about potential bias in algorithms and, and privacy around data and transparency. Um, how are the ethical challenges that Salesforce has faced informing your philanthropic strategies? 
So for context in my work, we really work with nonprofits that support the populations I've mentioned, uh, specifically focused on where we work and live, major cities, thinking about how do we support those, again, furthest from success. At Salesforce, our number one value is trust. And I literally was on a company call the last two days, and we use that a lot, and it's a value that really guides all our decisions. In the AI world, it's information in is information out. The quality that you put in, the quality you put out. If the data that you put in is poor, information out. And so at the heart of what we're trying to figure out is what does it mean as a company to really interrogate and build this trust layer so that the information and data that we already have in stores as the customer data is being correctly guarded, used, and disseminated through those systems, like you making sure that they're getting everything the customer needs. I think my mic is going in now. Thank you. Um, and that that information is being correctly curated and used in a direct manner. And trust is the, the number one value you have to have. You have to think about this as a tech company. If you lose trust, you lose value, you lose customers. So you have to ensure that everything is protected and safe. Within that, we've really thought a lot about, what Peter mentioned earlier, a lot around what are the ethical use, the ethical practices, what are the policies needed for us to guide our principles. So we have AI committees that make sure that the information that we're going to use it, it's first filtered, it's first make sure it's correct, make sure it's safe, and then it goes out. We don't just say here it is and this is the best way. We want to make sure the, com the customer data is, is guarded and used so that others feel safe coming to Salesforce. When I think about the partners we work with and we talk about in the nonprofit space, a lot of nonprofits are struggling just to have money. So when we talk about AI, they're like, wait, wait, hold on. Let's first talk about what does it mean? But in this conversation, they're saying, why should we believe you? Because we're just trying to get our mission and make sure we are having impact on our young, on whoever the population we're trying to serve. So what we really think about is, how can we inform policy? How can we make sure that our trust layer is unlike anyone else's? How can we make sure that the nonprofits and the, the customers we work with are getting everything they need to make sure that then the customers they work with are getting the information they have? So at the, bot at the end of the day, it really comes down to making sure you have all of the systems and protocols in place at every interval. It can't just be we did one thing. It has to be a system that's checked, it has to be a system that's reviewed, it has to have outside indicators used, it has to have a lot of metrics, and I think this is important, and Peter mentioned it, what we're doing today has to evolve because the future is unknown. What is happening right now and the policies and, the, and all the things needed for safety must evolve because one thing is getting true. AI has been around for a while and it is getting smarter and smarter and smarter. So therefore the policies and of course that trust layer has to get stronger so it can be ready for the future that supports you. That's a great lead into a question I have here for my friend Peter. So Peter, Silicon Valley Leadership Group champions a human-centered approach to AI that emphasizes explainable outcomes, equity, and risk mitigation. Those are great words to have on a website, but I want to know a little bit more about what they mean. How are these principles guiding your work with member companies to promote responsible AI practices, especially given what Ron just said, the rapid pace of AI development is often outpacing formal regulation. I, I think the, the history of innovation is full of examples. Uh, it's, it, it's back, it's all good. Uh, it, full of examples of technology moving far quicker than regulation. And that's, that's not surprising, right? That, that's not entirely surprising, right? Because you've got innovators who, are, who do this every day. They're thinking of new inventions and they are bringing new ideas to, to the public, to the market, to research, et cetera. And politicians and regulators, one, have to try to figure out, okay, what the heck is this new technology? And then the second thing they have to figure out is, okay, well, what are the consequences, both positive and negative, of this new technology? And so to, to Ron's point, the, the technology in particular around artificial intelligence is moving at a, at a at warp speed, exponentially faster than almost any other technology we have seen in our lifetimes. And so as a result, 
we look at this issue as the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, as an organization that represents innovation companies, we look at this issue as one where how do we promote flexible guidelines and principles that can be applied regardless of a particular technological standard or threshold in a particular moment. And so if we are guided by high level principles, those will be relevant regardless of the compute or, or other characteristics of the technology that may come later. And so human-centered AI is, I think, at the heart of what we are trying to promote among our member companies. And it really gets the idea that as this technology in particular is developed and ultimately deployed, it should be considered how do we ensure, as best we can, that humans are, remain kind of central, not only to the development of the technology, so guiding the technology, but central also to thinking about how are humans going to be impacted by the outcomes of the technology. And one principle in particular I think is super important here is preserving that element of human discretion, recognizing that, yes, you're, you're going to have smarter and smarter uh, uh, systems and programs and algorithms, but they are still governed ultimately and directed by humans, and their work should be reviewed by humans. And those decisions that they make should be made in human speed, such that there is time for humans to think about what the consequences are and to ultimately make the decision and exercise that discretion. So I think that element of preserving, as the, as the cliche is, you know, the human in the loop, that element of preserving the human actor is super important, and I underline the word actor, because that is the human with agency to proactively direct the work of the AI in whatever field it is, whether it's in finance or healthcare or ag tech or whatever, warfare even. Um, so I, I think preserving that human agency is super important. Quick, quick follow-up question for you. How many member companies are there at SVLG? So we have approximately 200 member companies working in all manner of different industries uh, around uh, innovation. So hardware, software, social media, uh, of financial firms that underwrite a lot of the research and development. Research institutions like this fine one we're sitting in right here today. Uh, so a lot of different players that I think are representative of the breadth and the depth of the innovation ecosystem here in Silicon Valley. Okay, so speaking about the different interests in, in the Valley, I'm gonna come to you, Tony. First of all, if you're from this area, you know who the Sobrato organization is. But if you're not from this area, you might not know about Sobrato. So can you tell us a little bit about the Sobrato organization? And then I've got a follow-up question for you. No, absolutely. We're doing the mic game. Um, let me just first take a moment, Sal, to, to thank you, to thank Cynthia, the faculty uh, here. It, you know, the what you see in this room, it is late in the day, but it is exemplary of what we need to do more of. We've got uh, in Silicon Valley Leadership Group a great leadership organization trying to find collective cause for its members. Two great technology corporations. Um, I'm a little bit different in terms of what I represent here organizationally. The Sobratos. Uh, began a real estate development business almost 60, more than 60 years ago uh, that then grew to be a meaningful size real estate development company. Uh, it still is an, a real estate operating company and it is one of three columns of the organization that I get to lead. Uh, the second column is a large uh, capital stack uh, that does a whole range of investing and the third is a set of philanthropy vehicles. And that mission I mentioned earlier is one that was charted by the owners of the, uh, the company, the Sobrato family, in their commitment to try to actually evidence a conscious capitalist model of, yes, we are a for-profit real estate business, yes, we do a lot in the capital markets uh, to try to drive profit, but we are doing that and they have charged us to do that in order for us to deploy that money at scale in an effective way with partners uh, to make positive change in the world. And uh, they put their money where their mouth is, they have walked the walk, they are amongst the most uh, engaged Gates pledgers of all of the Gates pledgers, 
and I'm very, very proud and honored to be uh, working with my team and, uh, and to try to pursue that mission. Now, in that, if you think about the, the two elements of the mission that I described of equitability and sustainability, that three-column model of a real estate business capital and philanthropies is wrapped by two primary initiatives. One is around housing security, and the other is around driving sustainability. Uh, our patriarch founder, John Albert Sobrato, he's 85, uh, he knows about tonight. He was excited that we're having this conversation. He's a huge believer in SJSU, and uh, we will continue to do things to support the, uh, the incredible work that happens here. Uh, he is passionate about taking all of the muscle, all of the experience, all of the connections and capabilities of our real estate business and trying to get to scaled affordable housing uh, solutions for our region. We just recently announced a deal called the Bay Area Housing Innovation Fund. Uh, Apple uh, joined us in our in the initial investment in that. We hope to have other corporations join in that. And then from a sustainability perspective, we are still, I will admit to you, uh, examining what our best approach is there. Uh, we have, we purchased a building in San Francisco recently uh, that was built in 1905, uh, one Harrison. We are fully electrifying that building. That has cost to it. So one of the complexities of being the CEO of a no mission, no profit, no profit, no mission organization is how do we balance all of the daily trade-offs of living our values and trying to advance a greater good for the community around us that the family and the team are very, very focused on while also uh, continuing to grow business. So we are in a constant state of managing growth, risk, and impact. How AI applies to that is pervasive across each of those three columns and the two verticals that I mentioned. How we are going to be using uh, especially generative AI to, on the philanthropy side, take, take our grants this year. We granted uh, to 400 grantees uh, in 2024 that are critical to uh, the community. We have a place-based philanthropic strategy about thriving communities and economic mobility and how our, uh, our team can, without causing pain to those grantees, actually assess their ability to make an impact so that we can justify more investment for them, but not just follow the old philanthropic you know, fumbles of asking them to to fill out more and more reports and to, uh, to take up their scarce capacity? Could we use AI to actually take what they do generate already and assemble an outcomes framework that we then take back to them in a participatory way to allow them to judge whether in fact it is an accurate assessment of their, of their work, of their outcomes, both qualitatively and quantitatively, and the list goes on. So we have our teams examining the application of this great technology across both the businesses, the impact engines of real estate capital, as well as our philanthropic social impact strategies in living scaled housing security and trying to address uh, the threat to the planet. I was gonna ask you a follow-up question, but you covered it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep moving on to Stacy here. Stacy, um, moving into the philanthropy space, can you tell us about the Adobe for All and, and how Adobe is contributing to the development of a diverse and responsible AI workforce? that is equipped to address the ethical challenges of technology. Yeah, so Adobe for All is, is our internal values where we believe everyone has a seat at the table and everyone's included and great ideas can come from everywhere. Um, and that's also a tenet of our philanthropic giving. And so when we look to the areas where we think Adobe's uniquely positioned to not only provide philanthropy but also bring our products, bring the best of our people. Adobe for All is one part of it, and certainly Creativity for All is another aspect of it. And so given all that we are doing in the area of AI, and given how much we've thought about it, and the products we have, and the leadership we have, uh, we are evolving what we have called the Digital Academy, which will provide curriculum around ethical AI, content creation using AI, and digital marketing using AI. Um, and we will make this curriculum available for free on places like Adobe uh, Express.com, as well as through Coursera and through nonprofits. Um, we are offering scholarships for this because an important part of this is upskilling people who want to participate in AI because as we've all shared, and I deeply believe this is a moment where we can bridge 
the digital divide, not widen it. And so giving people a basic understanding of AI and then giving them curricula and paths to learn content creation, digital marketing skills um, is a very big investment for Adobe, certainly philanthropically, but our products as well. Um, certainly, yes, people will use our products and that is a good thing. Uh, but the end goal is to get 30 million people upskilled in the next five years. Wonderful, thank you. Ron, I'm gonna come to you about Salesforce philanthropy. One of the things that I, I love about Salesforce's strategy is, is you have a history of supporting efforts to increase STEM diversity that have broad impact rather than serving your near-term business needs. Can, can you elaborate a bit more on Salesforce strategy to uh, support the development of an ethical AI workforce and, and in particular AI education for underrepresented communities? So when we thought about Let's, let's go back about 18 months. You know, everyone, AI has been around for a long time. Like this, it's not a new thing. I think if you ask a 18 year old, they're like, I've been doing this for longer than everybody. So why are you talking about what's all the excitement about? But when you think about it in kind of in the adult world in the, in the tech world and tech space, you have to go back about 18 months. And it just took it, it was a massive wave. And it just washed over everyone and everyone said, whoa, what do we do? For us, it really started with finding great partners to invest and say, hey, how can you help think about the future of AI? So we had some partners such as AIEDU. They have been working in the AI space since 2015, and they were doing professional development and training for educators. So we said, hey, let's partner, let's have a conversation. We brought them in. The first thing we saw them do was they brought in 100 young people in San Francisco, and they went to providing professional development and training for them on AI skills and development. We were like, this is powerful. We invested in them and then said, how can you support our teachers and our educators and our school boards and our parents in the AI universe and reskill them and help them prepare for the future? We then went to other partners like Jobs for the Future and said, hey, we understand that we need to think about reskilling. We need to understand that the world needs to look at how the jobs are going to change. Can we work with you? Can we partner? Can we learn from you? They opened up an office of ethical use. They talked about equity in AI. They talked about reskilling because if you're if you're in the reskilling or workforce development space, you know jobs for the future. And they bring all these together. We said, let's invest in you. Can you help us? Can you help us learn? Can you work with our partners? Can you really think about how to change the, the future workforce and what do you need from us? So we think about for our, through our philanthropy, how can we find great partners that are smarter than us, that have been doing the work longer than us, that are really learning and listening and invest in them and work alongside them. And that's the first thing. The second thing is, how do we invest around policy and ethical use? You know, and we think about it through the lens of not just generally. I think we have to be careful that we say a general policy is gonna be right for everyone. Hey, just invest in this, this uh, change will support everyone. No, how are we working in groups that are intentionally looking at the outcomes of those specific subpopulations we're trying to serve? In the major cities like San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Oakland, around the world, how are you supporting those communities? How are you really going deep? How are you engaging those communities? How are you getting feedback from those communities? How are you not telling those communities what to do, but engaging with them to make sure they're bubbling up the, the information and policies they need? And then how can we use our investments to really help elevate that work? And then lastly, we use our own internal platform, Trailhead, to really reskill and really think about the, that, that we can give you a platform where you can learn. And it's a, there's no one size fits all in this new world. So our investments have to be, they have to be strategic because we don't have unlimited, unlimited funds. They have to be investing in partners that are trusted, going back to my original thought around trust. And then they have to be willing to, to be diversified. There are major groups that are well-funded and are doing great work, but guess what? There are innovative young nonprofits that are hungry and scrappy and trying to do the work and change the landscape. And we invest in them as well because we want them, they're gonna be the ones that are just bubbling up these crazy ideas that in 10 years, everyone's gonna be like, you should have invested in them 10 years ago. And so that's the kind of thing we really think about as we make our investments in this new space. Just when Ron talked about AI has been around for a while, I'll just let you know that when I talked to my team at Sobrato about the use of AI, um, that knowing that, that I joined Microsoft in the 90s, they asked me if I was responsible for Clippy. <laughs> and so um, I, I think you need to basically be over 45 to get that joke. But um, if you're under 45, you could look it up. Um, and no, I was not. I do know the guy who was, but no. It, some would say the first AI application. 
fun fact. Um, Peter, I'm going to come to you now. We've just heard from two companies, and, and I, you know, to be transparent, I invited friends and allies to join this conversation. Uh, they are representative of a certain population in Silicon Valley, but it would be remiss to suggest that this is the approach of all technology companies. Peter's organization represents a broad range of interests, as he told you. So, Peter, how receptive in general are your member companies to addressing ethical AI issues? And are you finding any common threads of concern? Oh, and the mic. Thank you. And, and, and just to set the record straight, I laughed at that, but I'm under the age of 45. Aww. So I thought it, I thought it was great. Uh, but be that as it may, you know, ethical AI and the concerns among our membership, I mean, Ron really set the stage at the very beginning. It's all about trust, right? If you don't have trust, you are going to inhibit not only the development of the technology, but I think more importantly, the public acceptance of the technology. And so a lot of our member companies have joined uh, voluntary organizations. They've made voluntary commitments ahead of regulations to address some of the ethical concerns uh, that, that AI gives rise to. And so I think they're, I think the common thread among many of them is there is a genuine desire to get out in front, some, in front of some of these problems early. Because I think there is an understanding that as we've all kind of said, we're at a very unique moment. We're, we're really at kind of the, the bend in the elbow and it can kind of go either way really. Um, in terms of the development of the technology. So there is time to input certain values into the technology and ensure that it grows with those values versus trying to do that after the fact and graft it on. And so I think there, if there is a common sentiment that I can, that I can you know, glean from our, our diverse members, it really is a desire, one, to get out in front of this, and two, to help build that public trust, which ultimately, yes, is good for the bottom line, let's be honest, but I think it also leads to a better community around when people feel that they can, they can use the tools to grow in, into jobs that maybe they couldn't have before, or they see the technology being used to address housing concerns or, or issues around content creation. So I think building that trust is, is certainly at the top of the list for our member companies. So Peter, you're dealing really often with the leadership of organizations and, and how they are perceiving the landscape and their interests and concerns. Tony, your uh, grantee portfolio is, is full of organizations that are really doing a lot of deep in place community work and the Sobrato organization um, is deeply invested in, in education um, holistically. So um, Sobrato prioritizes I'm going to read this because I want to get these words right. I think they're so meaningful. Community-driven, cradle-to-career approaches that advance belonging, economic mobility, and build power and autonomy. Those are not words we often hear coming from revenue-generating organizations. <laughs> Um, how is Sobrato thinking about the integration of AI workforce preparedness to ensure that in individuals from historically marginalized communities, one, not only have pathways to learn AI skills that provide financial security, but two, also have the agency and support to shape the development and application of AI in ways that benefit their communities? You know, my fellow panelists talked about trust. Um, I'm going to start first with agency and then maybe go to pathways. I'm very fortunate in that my colleagues on our philanthropies team are uh, come from the communities that we serve and many of them uh, led critical nonprofits working deep in place. And so they teach us in the more sort of established power model every day on how we might uh, be better and do better. In that regard, pretty much everything we decide and that we do is participatory. So that is it, the, when we were talking about trust, I think the next question is yes, but how? And, 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 my, and my, my fellow panelists spoke to some of the how. For us, some of that how is that we have uh, very close partnerships 
uh, named participatory partnerships with both community-based organizations uh, and in many cases increasingly with actual residents who are impacted to inform uh, our approaches. That will also, and is increasingly now in the area of outcome measurement, uh, be true with our use of AI. And it'll be more complicated in that we are all learning quickly. Uh, as I think uh, Ron mentioned, uh, it is getting uh, smarter, faster and faster, Peter said this as well, than any technology uh, since the history of humankind. And for us all to catch up with, to that is a, is a challenge. Uh, the, the, so the, the fundamental answer to agency is to be on the ground, shoulder to shoulder, and co-designing our solutions as well as interpreting what is and isn't working with algo bias, with misinformation, uh, with the range of, of challenges that will come up with it. Uh, in terms of pathways, you know, if, if one looks at the uh, you know, uh, birth to death journey of a resident, uh, we have obviously this category of education and this category of economic opportunity. Both of those, uh, those pathways right now are fraught with missteps and gaps. And there, are, there is a, in the US, unlike other parts of the world where there is more embedded apprenticeship type of bridges between education and economic opportunity. But to the credit of SJSU, um, it is the leader for this region in trying to bridge that connection. Uh, that there is an enormous opportunity for us to make sure that we are investing, we philanthropy, and we are encouraging other large philanthropy, both corporate and private, to invest in that access point. We've, we've all said it in different ways, but if we don't get the tools and the education in the hands of uh, all of our residents to be able to have that be, in fact, an, an equity imperative, then that, that horrific scenario of exponentially falling behind, exponentially increasing the wealth income gap, et cetera, is going to happen. So our strategies right now are to take things like what we've done with SJSU around the K-16 collaborative and just imbue it with a focus on access to those tools and education. And you know, I think for, for there may be, I am not an AI expert, but there are probably some in the room. Um, for those lay people like myself, th you, this is not something you really are, you can't talk about it and learn it. You have to do it. And so, you're, so all of us, I think, are trying to use it more and more every day. How do we give access to all of our kids, mm -hmm. all our kids, the ability to, to learn it. Um, the comment I think that, that, that Stacy might have made was that uh, these kids are in fact uh, very technologically savvy, um, but at the same time we know that some of these are subscription models and so we want to invest in uh, trying to close those gaps both on the education side. You know, nationally uh, districts are struggling mightily with how to use AI and there is a lot of misuse of AI from very well-intended administrators and teachers who are, who are trying to use this, this technology to operate their, their systems more effectively and to educate their kids. There's algo bias in some of the AI uh, programs that students are using that uh, puts uh, kids of color at, in unfortunate um, discriminatory situations where they're being accused of plagiarism when they're not necessarily um, doing things with the intention or the result of plagiarism. So the pitfalls go on. Uh, economic opportunity, I think, is, is going to be born of our, our equipping all of those young people with that same level of knowledge that other kids that may be uh, more privileged have. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm going to wrap us up here with one final question. Um, Peter, you mentioned uh, the need for human arbitrators and interaction throughout the AI process. And we've been talking all day long about um, where humans pay, play roles in not only the guidance of AI, but how we are civically engaging in our communities. Um, I'm gonna ask you each to share three traits that you look for in your human partnerships. And Peter, do you mind kicking us off? So I think first is integrity, uh, emotional and intellectual integrity. Uh, it has to be at the top of the list for me. I think a second characteristic is a good sense of humor. 
um, life is too important not to have a good time. And I, I mean that in the way that there are so many studies that show that people perform better in almost every task when they're relaxed and when they're having a good time. So I think a sense of humor is essential. And I think the last one for me is I want to see somebody who is unfailingly optimistic. And when I say optimistic, I don't mean in a Pollyannish, everything's fine, you've got your head in the sand, but rather more opportunistic, that you're always looking for something positive that can come out of any situation. And believe me, it's been really hard for me to put this in practice this week. But be that as it may, I want to work with and interact with and be around people who are always thinking about how they can maximize what it is they are doing. And I, my, my wife and I joke about this all the time, and we, we get along, we're best friends, and I say it's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have anybody else in the world if I were in a foreign country where I didn't speak the language, I lost my passport, my wallet, and all my money. I want somebody who is right there with me who's gonna say, okay, what are we gonna do? That's the kind of person who's optimistic and looking for opportunities. I would say three things when looking uh, for the right kind of partnerships. The first is uh, post-ego mutual accountability on what are we doing together to achieve our common objectives. Uh, the second is a spirit of, of brutal honesty without brutality, direct as respect, problems will arise. The only thing that's guaranteed about partnerships 100% is there will be problems. There, there will be difficulties. You have to have the right kind of attitude to be able to work through those respectfully, but clearly and directly. And then following kind of bridging on those first two is uh, that uh, when th hard things happen, there is an orientation of the partner to try to find the compromise to bridge and to not break. Uh, the majority of partnerships are like the majority of startups. They fail. Uh, sometimes people don't even admit that they've failed, but they do. And uh, to be able to adapt them uh, for success is, is critical. Okay. okay. Um, I think we're looking for people who want to create the future and who say, hey, I have an idea and it's different, and we're going to try some things differently, and we want you to be along for that. And that innately brings a sense of curiosity and creativity. I would say the second thing is we're looking for partners who want to own the outcome together. Uh, it's a journey, and each, each party has to bring something to it. Each party has to be flexible. Each party has to realize the strengths and shortcomings of the other. And the third part is to be genuine, to tell the truth, to share what's working, to hold us accountable, and to push us to raise our bar as well. Um, and I think that genuine piece is actually what it all, all comes down to. Um, and I think, you know, I agree with Peter, you have to have a little fun along the way and laugh um, because these are really big problems that we're all trying to solve together. I would add, uh, number one, again, I mentioned already is trust and trustworthy. I think sometimes that means, you know, sometimes it's not always the same thing, you know. Um, but, you know, you stand on what you mean, you, you do what you say, you're accountable to yourself and accountable to everyone because if you can't do that, then how you shouldn't be a partner in anything. You have to have that trustworthy. Relationship and partnership driven. Um, we're in this together, good or bad, happy or sad. We want to do this together. I want you to thrive. I want us to be a part of your change, and I want you to get the glory. So in that relationship and in that partnership, we're able to make sure that we have the things that are needed in both directions. You have what you need to be successful. And lastly, it's outcome driven. You want to make sure you are driving change in the communities that you're supporting and serving. You are there to say, I have a mission. I, uh, we are going to do X, Y, and Z. We're going to have this metric. And no matter what happens, we're going to make sure that this occurs and this happens. And that's powerful because that gives you a, a, a determiner, a mission, a drive factor that's critical. So those two things are really important when we think about partnerships. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to say it again. Corporations are people. This morning, I invited those of you who were with us for my uh, opening remarks um, to learn something today. And I said, don't just acquire information. I challenge you to open your mind, open your heart, and truly learn something. I hope that you learned something from our friends and allies to education here and throughout your various panels. Um, thank you all so much for giving us your time and your wisdom today. Can we give our panelists a big round of applause?